Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi barakatuh. Welcome back to Convert Central. So alhamdulillah, we are coming to the second week of Ramadan and this is part of our Ramadan series that we are posting up on Sunday nights to kind of get everyone, uh, give everyone a refreshing uh, reminder about the month of Ramadan and its benefits and virtues. Uh, today, alhamdulillah, we have a very, very special guest with us. Uh, we have Sheikh Ahmad Al-Azari with us. He's also the Religious Affairs Director of the Forgotten Souls. And uh, we'd like to first extend a shout out and a big thank you to MIJ as well for without their uh, contributions and their efforts in making this collaboration possible we have not been able to record the podcast with Sheikh today <laughs> so Alhamdulillah uh, first and foremost you know this is coming to week 2 of Ramadan so uh, everyone kind of already started you know our first few days of Ramadan uh, and this coming to week 2 we wanted to really reinforce uh, what should our mindset already be like in the month of Ramadan so maybe we could start by asking Sheikh um uh, what are the inner and outer aspects of performing the fast? Like, is there even a difference in what are the inner and outer aspects of performing okay. the fast? Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wassalamu ala Sayyidina Rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. So, um, Alhamdulillah. Uh, every act of worship has its um, has its outward and inward uh, realities. The outward realities are, you could say, these are. This is the the structure of the act of worship itself. So let's say, for example, when we speak about salah, we have a, an outward structure that is related to the takbirah of al-ihram. We have certain requirements in terms of the wudu that we need to, um, that we need to do before the salah. We have a, a certain outline of the different acts that we ought to do in salah as well. Um, these outward realities, they have inward um, or internal uh, significance, internal realities, spiritual realities, that the aim of um, the Muslim, the aim of the believer is to, is to reap that internal fruit, that spiritual fruit. So when we, when we come to the aspect of fasting, you know, there is a, a hadith of the Prophet والسلام, that kind of uh, highlights the importance of the inner realities of fasting. Um, and it is a, it's a very profound hadith. And also scholars used to be, when they come to narrate this hadith, they would usually be um, uh, in a state of um, concern. Mm? Let, let's put it that way, in a state of concern. Um, it's the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ says, you know, the, the, the one who does not leave foul language, does not, the one who does not abstain from foul language, the one who does not abstain from transgression, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no interest in his abstaining from, from food and, and drink. Mm. So that kind of highlights that uh, Ramadan is not about, a, is not about starvation. Mm. We is, sometimes we... Um, uh, uh, Growing, in, uh, growing up in Egypt, in the Muslim world or in the Arab world, it was a, a common, you could say, misconception that was sometimes told by families or teachers that fasting is, we fast Ramadan to feel how the poor people are feeling. Mm. And then as we grow up, we, you know, we discover that poor people also fast, right? And then we start asking, okay, maybe their fasting is different Right? We, 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 we are supposed to endure some kind of a harsher you know, way of fasting, but then we discover that also the, the type of uh, rules or regulations, the type of conditions, requirements for fasting are the same. You can be a billionaire, um, and you could be someone who barely find, you know, can, can, can find, uh, uh, you know, put food on the table, but at the same time, you know, you're still gonna fast from, you know, from Fajr to Maghrib, same things that nullify the fasting here would apply there as well. So it makes no difference how much money you have. Um, so it has to be something other than that sense of uh, that sense of starvation or feeling the hunger. I mean, it could work for some people. I mean, this could be an added bonus, right? They they feel how hungry people are feeling. So then you know that would help them, or you could say would propel them to give out more to charity or something of that sort. But we would then understand that this is not the core of fasting or why fasting was originally, mm. originally ordained. And um, the, uh, I would say the, the core of the, the, um, 
the significance, the inner significance of fasting is it allows us to, number one, to understand and to realize the defects of our egos, right? Mm -hmm. Because we, we know that during the month of Ramadan, the doors of paradise are open and that uh, the, the, the shaitan is, is uh, confined mm -hmm. during the month of Ramadan. So any kind of shortcoming, it's not from the, from the whispers, from not from the waswas of the shaitan. Mm -hmm. It is rather from the promptings of the lower self, of the, um, of the ego. Mm -hmm. So Ramadan then is like a month of exposure, in a sense. It exposes the ego, right? You can, you, you can basically um, spot your ego as it's, you know, as it is doing the crime, right? <laughs> in a sense, you know, you would realize the shortcomings of the ego during the month of Ramadan. Um, so this is number one. Number two, it's uh, in terms of the core of the significance of the month of Ramadan is to um, overcome that ego. So not only it tells us what are, the, what are the problems that we need to work on, it also allows us to work on that as well, mm. right? Um, uh, let me recap this and you know, we can move to another question, but um, you know, we as human beings, and this is something applicable to all of mankind, right? We as human beings, the first natural desire yeah. that is found within ourselves is the desire for food, mm. right? So um, I was sharing earlier today um, at, the, uh, 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 at a talk, you know, the, there is a famous psych, uh, uh, experiment of psychology, a psychological mm. experiment called the marshmallow test. I'm not sure if you heard of that or not. Um, it was conducted by a, by a psychologist named Walter Michel, and it's also published in a book. I, I believe he, he passed away. Um, and um, th this psychological experiment was basically based on, they would, they would invite the children who were about four or five years old mm -hmm. to a classroom where there's a desk, and obviously with parental consent, the parents will be attending, they can see what's happening from the cameras that are recording the experiment. And as the child would come in, they would come to sit on a desk just like this one, and they would place on a plate a piece of marshmallow. And then they will tell the child, you can either have this marshmallow now, or you can wait until we come back, and then you'll get two. Mm? You'll get a second one. And then they, they record, they videotape what, how children, you know, some of them, they don't wait until the prompt ends and they, they eat the marshmallow, right? They're not gonna even wait until you tell them Look, if you wait, you will get, they eat it immediately. <laughs> Others, um, they wait until the person exits and then they eat it. Mm -hmm. Some of them would put themselves to sleep. Some of them would start singing, you know, getting themselves distracted while, you know, they keep looking at the marshmallow. You can YouTube it, you know, if you write the marshmallow test on YouTube, you'll find some funny videos. But it also, you will see, if you, if, you, if you watch these videos from the lens of Ramadan, it will teach you so many things about yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Some of them would sniff it. Mm. Uh, some of them would take, you know, small pieces or lick the marshmallow <laughs> until they wait, you know, for the, for the second one. Some of them immediately after they get the second marshmallow, they stuff their cheeks with it. They put both of them together at the same time, you know? <laughs> So it teaches us something about desire and the human self. Mm. Mm. So Ramadan, basically, during the month of Ramadan, we, we learn to discipline this natural desire, right? And I always say that the, the ego is not interested in what is haram. Mm -hmm. and, and this is very important. Ego is not interested in what is haram. Mm -hmm. Ego is interested in the desires. Many of the desires are in and of themselves halal, mm -hmm. right? Shaitan is interested in what is haram. Shaitan could even, Shaitan plays the long, long game, right? So it, it, can, it can open a door of something that is good because it knows that it will eventually lead to something that is wrong, mm -hmm. right? It can tell you, you know, um, you, haven't, you haven't been reading so much lately. Why don't you open a book, you know, read something of religious knowledge, this and that. But he, but, but he would tell you this at the same time your mom is asking you to buy groceries. Mm -hmm. Right? So you would start delaying the groceries. You read the book. Your mom keeps saying, you know, why aren't you getting the groceries? Yeah, I'll get it. Just, you know, give me some, you know, half an hour, I'll get it. And then she keeps 
tell you once, twice, thrice, and then eventually uh, the, the person will get you know, grumpy and then would yell at his mom. So the shaitan then succeeds, you know, open a door of something that is good but not a priority so that it would lead to something that is wrong. Mm-hmm. The ego or the lower self is not interested in what is haram as the shaitan is. The lower self is interested in the, in the instant gratification, something that is, that, is, that is related to the natural desires. So Ramadan basically tells us that if we, if we, if we side, put, put to the side, if we marginalize the shaitan, take the shaitan out of the equation, right? What is the thing that is veiling us from being connected with Allah? Mm-hmm. It is nothing but the desires that come from within. And by disciplining the, 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 the natural desires, we can then become empowered to overcome the shaitan after Ramadan. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it becomes like a, a spiritual camp in a sense. Yeah. Inshallah, inshallah. Mm-hmm. I think that's why a lot of uh, our teachers also see like Ramadan is like a journey or it's like a school, right? The entire month is it's a journey of discovering ourselves and what are our tendencies and what are the things that, what are our buttons, you know, all of us, we might not be attracted to food, but we might be attracted to something else. Uh, for ourselves, it might be YouTube, it might be TikTok, things like mm-hmm. this, right? And we really get to discover it in the month of Ramadan. Sometimes it's food with the YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, because at the end of time, there's nothing to do, so you bring your, your, your phone out and you start scrolling on, on YouTube mm-hmm. and TikTok, mm-hmm. right? So I think well, for many of us, like in our own circles, we see in school and at work, a lot of us are planning for the month of Ramadan. In a sense, we're planning, okay, what are we going to eat for Sahur? Right? What are we going to eat for Iftar? Where mm-hmm. are we spending our time, you know, uh, every, every night, you know, in, in the month of Ramadan, which is good, mm-hmm. Alhamdulillah, it's good to plan as well, but these are the outer aspects as well, right? What are we doing in terms of our inner aspects of, 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 of mm-hmm. uh, in the month of Ramadan? What, what are our plans, right? So I think the awareness of it, like, like Sheikh has mentioned, like he has put it so clearly for us to see, there is clearly a, the difference between the outer aspect of fasting and the inner aspects of it, right? They're also in, interconnected as well, you know, uh, but then what is our plan in the month of Ramadan for, for these uh, aspects? Mm-hmm. So uh, perhaps Shay, you could elaborate on what then should our mindset be in the month of Ramadan to be successful? Um, th- th- this is an important question. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you asked this because um, many of us um, uh, uh, has been fasting through the month of Ramadan um, you know, for a, a number of years. It becomes unfortunately, or it can become, mm-hmm. unfortunately, as a, some kind of a routine. a routine, right? It's something that, you know, being raised in a Muslim family, so everybody's doing it, mm-hmm. so you do it like they do it, um, and you kind of lose um, the spirit of Ramadan, you would say. Mm-hmm. You, you lose the spirit of Ramadan. Um, if, I were to, if I were to summarize what are the three elements, three aspects of a, of a mindset of Ramadan, um, I would say it is, uh, let me begin with the first one. I would say love. Oh, hmm? no, Because, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the verse um, in which he ordained, in which he commanded us to fast, Fasting has been ordained upon you as it was ordained upon those before you. And we know it was not ordained upon those before us in the same format. But the concept of fasting, of abstaining, of self-discipline mm-hmm. through abstaining has been ordained on the people before us. Mm-hmm. Um, then he said, okay, so it was, it, it's ordained upon you as it was ordained upon those before you so that you may achieve taqwa. Right? Mm-hmm. Taqwa is an Arabic word that denotes taking caution, mm-hmm. right? seeking protection. And this is a little bit nuanced. So I want you to bear with me. Uh, usually scholars in the exegesis, in the tafsir, they explain taqwa as a way of um, being fearful mm. hmm, of punishment. But that is the external meaning of taqwa. Uh, there is a, a, an inner meaning that they implicitly mention. You would find it in the books of spirituality, not necessarily in the books of tafsir. Mm. And this inner meaning is that they say that the the, the, the greatest punishment is not the fire. That's not the greatest punishment. Mm-hmm. Is it a punishment? Yes, but that's not the greatest punishment. The greatest punishment is to be veiled from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Verily, on that day they shall be veiled from their Lord. Mm-hmm. So that is the, 
That is the, the, the greatest pain, the greatest suffering in a sense. So, taqwa is seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from being veiled from Allah. Hmm? So, you know, in, in Arabic poetry, the classical poetry, you know, you, you have these uh, 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 meanings of how the, the, po the, the poets, they, they say, uh, 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 you know, I pass by the houses uh, or by the, by the house, the house of Layla. Layla, that's his beloved. Uh, that's the lady, that, the, 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 the woman whom he loves. I pass through the, the house, or you could say houses. It's like a, maybe she lives in a condominium. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, apologize for the cheesy uh, uh, jokes about the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, Pre-Islam, but anyways, amuru ala diari diari Layla. I pass by the house of Layla. Uqabbilu uh, daljidari wa daljidar. I, you know, I, I. He's trying to reach Layla, but he cannot find Layla. So he he kisses the walls. Hmm? He kind of like orbits around the, you know, the the house, and he kisses the walls because he's so longing, so yearning for, for Layla. Hmm? So, the person who's in that type of love. They feel a sense of heat, right? And hence, you know, the word Ramadan originally, in, in the etymology of the word, it means heat, mm -hmm. uh, a heat that burns. And subhanAllah, in, during the month of Ramadan, we, it, the, the heat that burns is basically um, uh, the heat of love as it burns the desires of the lower self. Mm -hmm. So the month of Ramadan is about longing for that attachment, longing for that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the practical application, just as this man who loved Layla, he's leaving everything behind and he's kissing all the walls, hoping that Layla would let him in. So in a, in a sense, you know, when we make the dua at the end of Ramadan, when we say, you know, Allahumma inna ka afoon, ghafoor tuhibbul afu fa'afu anna, oh Allah, you know, you are, uh, you are accepting, you are all forgiving, uh, uh, you love to forgive and you love to accept, so accept us and forgive us. And we mentioned that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala frees um, uh, 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 his servants from, um, um, from punishment, from hellfire. We would then understand it as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I want you to have a wider perspective of what is this freeing, of this mm -hmm. liberating. Allah during the month of Ramadan, He liberates us from the confinement, from the shackles of our lower selves, our egos. This is what is blocking Majnoon Layla from reaching to Layla. <laughs> hmm? his, his own desires. He, could, doesn't, he doesn't want to sacrifice enough. Eh. So once he is, you know, he, he is so keen to reach to Layla, Layla will let him in. Eh. So I would say this is the first element uh, about Ramadan. Don't uh, uh, read, if you ever come across these meetings in the text, don't read it as the, you know, fear, while it is applicable to some extent. But that, that is not the, that should not be your propelling motive for the ibadah. Mm -hmm. The propelling motive of the ibadah is fear, but which type of fear? Not fear of a whip, mm -hmm. but rather fear that my beloved is not accepting me. Or rather fear that I'm not mm -hmm. loving my beloved to the degree that, that suits, it suits him. Mm? Mm. That, 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 is, that is the issue. I, do I love enough? Mm? So that should be my, that, that what, this should be, if there, if there should be a fear, it should be that type of a fear. Mm? Mm. Do I love him enough? Mm? So this is the first element. Second element is generosity. Mm? Month of Ramadan is a, is a month of generosity. The Prophet ﷺ so, in his virtues in the Shama'il, he was described by Sayyidah Aisha, she said, كَانَ الرَّسُولُ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ أَجْوَدَ النَّاسِ He was the most generous of people. وَكَانَ أَجْوَدْ مَا يَكُونْ فِي رَمَضَانِ This generosity is emphasized during the month of Ramadan. Now people usually confine the meaning of generosity to generosity by wealth. Yeah. How much money am I going to donate to charity? Am I going to pay my zakah during Ramadan? Will I uh, donate some money for uh, Ramadan iftar? These are all noble, beautiful things to do, and, and I encourage you to do it. 
but don't have a narrow perspective of charity. Charity, because mm. some people sometimes, unfortunately, they use charity as some kind of a, you know, as a leeway. Mm. I pay charity, now I can do whatever I want. So <laughs> I pay charity, right? I've been so generous with the charity, now I can be like all grumpy with people. No. Mm. A part of charity as well is being charity by your, being generous by your manners. Right? The Prophet said, that's mm -hmm. why he mentioned that if someone tries to get in a quarrel with you, in a dispute uh, mm -hmm. with you, you say, in Yisra'im, in Yisra'im. You remind yourself, I am fasting, I am fasting. You saw that, that you can be generous by your manners, by how you conduct yourself. You can be generous also by your time in serving others. Um, you can be generous by, by your service. We know Sayyidina Abba ibn Abbas was the cousin of the Prophet والسلام, and the Prophet والسلام, made dua for him that Allah would, 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 grant him, uh, would grant him knowledge and understanding of intricate matters. Mm -hmm. Sayyidina Abba ibn Abbas used to pause his i'tikaf. Right? So i'tikaf is such a, <clears throat> a, a dedicated act of worship the last 10 days. But he would say, it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, values my service, that a service that I would do to a brother over my, the time I do in i'tikaf. Hmm? So let's say, for example, you have a, an aunt, an uncle, a, a grandparent, a grandmother, a neighbor. They have back problems or something, and they want to move something around the house. They want someone to drive them somewhere. Yeah, a, 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 an old relative of yours wants somebody to take them to a doctor's appointment. Mm. You don't say, oh, yeah, they can wait after Eid. Why did they choose the doctor appointment you know, during the last 10 days? Mm. Usually people don't choose when to be sick, right? But mm. you know, you, 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 you're helping, you're, you're, if you drive them to that doctor's mm. appointment, that is more, especially if you do it with that intention, mm. that the Prophet was the so most so generous. So I want to embody this meaning in Ramadan. Fifth meaning of being generous in Ramadan is if you become aligned with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Ramadan. How is that? What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do in Ramadan? He liberates, he forgives. Mm -hmm. He frees people from shackles and confinements. He let go. Uh, so during the month of Ramadan, especially at the time of Sahur, when you're having this, this meal, and it's towards the last third of the night, make a dua for someone who traumatized you in the past who exploited your rights, who transgressed against you. Hmm? And you say, oh Allah, you, uh, and every night of Ramadan, you, you free people, you, let, you free your, your, your servants, you, you, you liberate them. And I am letting go as well. Huh? I am forgiving this individual. And I will have this intention, even if my heart is not so uh, feeling it. <laughs> huh? Even if my heart wants to make dua against the person mm -hmm. rather than for. Hmm? But if you spend the, the whole month of Ramadan, every night you make a dua for that individual. On one hand, you become aligned with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See, what, what, oh Allah, you, you forgive people during this month, so I, I, I forgive this individual as well. And also the Prophet ﷺ, you know, the Prophet ﷺ says, mm -hmm. I preserved my intercession for the people of the major sin of my ummah. Mm -hmm. Meaning, people of major sin, meaning the Prophet ﷺ said, don't do, and they did. Right? Mm -hmm. It's a prohibition, and it's an important prohibition, and yet they transgressed. And they... Mm -hmm committed what the Prophet ﷺ prohibited. So he said, I preserve my intercession on the Day of Judgment for those individuals. Right? So you emulate the Prophet ﷺ by seeking intercession for a person who did not listen to your prohibition. You said, you know, don't harm me and they harmed you. Uh, so when you, when you make a dua for them, you, you embody this prophetic, uh, 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 prophetic uh, uh, mercy and grace. I just want to add something here, you know, the Sayyidi Abdul Habib Sha'arani radiallahu anhu was a great saint of Egypt in the 10th century. He used to make a dua, say, oh Allah, um, oh Allah, don't make me in need of the good deeds of any individual in the hereafter. Don't let anyone be in debt to me in the akhirah. Why? He said, because I feel embarrassed that the Prophet ﷺ is doing intercession, taking people 
out from Hellfire, and then I take them, I take them and then I put them back in. How would I face him? He is so keen to intercede and let people go, and after he takes them out, I take them and put them back in. How would I face him? And so this is the kind of meaning that if you have during the month of Ramadan, um, uh, uh, would be valuable. Um, so we said uh, love, generosity, and you can, by extension of generosity, we can highlight this, this meaning of seeking forgiveness and also extending forgiveness as well. Mashallah, mm. yeah. mm. mashallah. Uh, Mashallah, Sheikh, thank you for sharing, uh, you know, on the, the various pointers that you, that you shared thus far. But I have a follow-up question with regards to what you shared. Because, uh, and I know the podcast is, is, is starting to get slightly long as well. But th I think this question is quite important in the sense where there's so much that you've mentioned, right? And where do we start in that case? Like, for someone that hasn't had that awareness, then how do we start on this journey that you've just mentioned? How do we start on the? Uh, on... Even on one of the things that you've just mentioned like in, in the month of Ramadan, how then do we start? How do we start? We, uh, we put it in practice. Uh, so the meaning of forgiveness, you make the dua during the time of suhoor. Um, uh, uh, when it's about uh, love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is, the, this is what, you, what you remind yourself of why you're fasting. Right, so as you make the intention, don't make the intention only about that I'm fasting you know, uh, tomorrow, which is let's say Tuesday, I'm fasting tomorrow, which is Wednesday. Mm -hmm. But remind yourself of the meaning of why, um, uh, uh, of why you're fasting. Ex extend that meaning as well to people around you. you know, uh, there, is, there are two extremes that sometimes people fall into. One extreme is that when they commercialize Ramadan, right? Mm -hmm and uh, make it all about buying goods and food and this and that. And on the other hand, when it becomes, you know, some people think that, okay, the, the right way is to uh, seclude yourself completely, mm. right? Mm. Uh, one has to strike a balance where, um, where they can have this spiritual seclusion, but at the same time, you know, coming together in Ramadan, sharing the congregation of Taraweeh, but also sharing the breakfast together as well. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a sense of communion in Ramadan that one ought to be, um, that one ought to share and embrace and celebrate as well. You know, seclusion, yes, it means that you know your priorities, right? I'm, I'm not saying when it's time for Taraweeh, leave Taraweeh and, you know, hang out or something. Um, Taraweeh is something that we ought to be keen about. Um, so, I mean, it just... I'm not sure if I'm clear with this, but strike a balance between so, some brothers, for example, you know, if, it, if it's Ramadan, they would start kind of, you know, not, not responding to messages, you know, um, I, I'm fine, however, with leaving the social media, I'm fine with that, right? But what I, what I mean is that, you know, they try to have a, a very uh, a solitary uh, 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 way, a, a very solitary approach. It can be understandable to a certain extent, mm. right? As long as it is done with mindfulness, mm. right? Um, as long as it's not done with, with rigidity. Mm. You get my point? Yes. yes, you have to be focused, obviously. Yeah. It's a spiritual camp, right? So you have to be focused. You, you, don't wanna, you don't wanna lose time. You wanna make sure that you're using your time in a very, mm. uh, in, in a very productive way. Yeah. Yeah. But you have to include within that time this type of uh, collectivity. I'm not sure if I answered your question there. What, what do you think? That you, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I just I think I'm just so overwhelmed by how much I'm learning. Um, it just kind of went off. But but that was alhamdulillah such a beneficial sharing. I think maybe one of the things that was really stood out to us was how maybe like the the first step is really if you if you can give me your thoughts on this on on recognizing what. What are your is your lower self telling you to do during Ramadan? Because a lot of times, maybe for us at least, um, when when we fast in Ramadan, it's very much of I'm hungry and I'm thirsty, and and it's a sense of self righteousness. Like I am doing this for the sake of Allah. Like mm. oh, yeah, Allah, I'm doing this for you. Mm -hmm. But 
our lower selves tell us that. And, and I think it was so beautiful from what you shared that it's not just that, but rather we have to remind ourselves when we, when we hear these thoughts from our lower selves, recognize that it's coming from a place of, of testing you and, and then remind ourselves like, yeah, Allah, I'm hungry and I'm thirsty, but I fear that I'm not loving you enough in this month, that I'm not being generous enough for your sake in this month, that I'm not forgiving enough for your sake so that you can forgive me. Um, I think that's such a beautiful mindset for us to take in Ramadan and beyond Ramadan, um, as you've said. Correct. I mean, I'm glad that you brought this up, mm. you know, this whole meaning of, you know, sometimes, because see, the, the, the lower self, the ego, when you take away from it the, the physical, tangible desires, mm. it tries to find a loophole in something else, right? <laughs> so it then craves for prestige and rank. Because it doesn't like to think that it has been giving up on these physical desires for nothing, mm. right? So, if I'm giving up all the food and the, the desires that the, the, the you know um, that I usually enjoy and so on and so forth, mm. then this sacrifice ought to be compensated in a way that I like. Mm. Mm? So. Uh, it, it will t then tend to, you know, to kind of have these I thoughts or ideas of, oh, mashallah, you're so good. You know, people are out there, you know, doing whatever they're doing. You know, they might be doing things, whether things that are halal or things that are haram. Mm. Uh, so there are those out there who are maybe spending their nights in pubs. And there you are, you are at the mosque, mm. praying congregation, taraweeh, 20 Rakaz, mashallah, what kind of strength and capacity? You're so spiritual. That is the moment, you know, if you play, you probably played the snake and the ladder, right? <laughs> As children. This is the moment where you, you know, where you roll the dice and you stand on the head of the, of the snake. So mm -hmm. you go mm, from the very beginning, restart, yeah. right? Um, so that's, the, that's how the lower self is. It, 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 when you when you take away from it the tangible desires, it start looking for desires that are related to values mm. and meanings, so prestige, rank, and so mm. on and so forth. You know, I learned from one of my teachers, and it's written in the books. It's not something that has been orally, only orally transmitted, and this is obviously part of our tradition. Not all the meanings are actually written in books, but the, but it's mentioned in some of the works as well, the um, uh, by Sayyidi Abdul Ghani Nabulsi and others. They say that. Never see yourself better than anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought to existence, even a pig. Mm. And it's mentioned in books as such, even a pig. And you might think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ we have, Verily we have dignified uh, you know, the, 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 the children of Adam. Correct from this perspective, mm. definitely. Allah mm. subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, uh, uh, we have a spirit that is from Allah. We have the aql, which is the, the light of understanding and cognition and so on and so forth. The intellect, absolutely. But from the perspective of the consequence of the, of the individual, they say, as an individual, as Ahmed, I don't know if I will go to paradise or hellfire. Mm. Hmm? But we know from our tradition that animals, after compensation, they turn into dust. Mm -hmm. Other than the animals that could enter paradise. But once the animal takes compensation, takes compens compensation from other animals that harmed it, and from human beings as well. Mm -hmm. You know, in the Hanafi Madhab, just as a, a, a marginal issue, I will come back. In the Hanafi Madhab, they say that the wrongdoings against animals is more severe than human beings. Because the human being, you can ask them for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, if I heard an individual, I can ask him, do you forgive me? You know, I can try to compensate. Mm -hmm. But then if you harm a dog or a cat, how would you know that they forgave? One wouldn't know. So they say that it's more severe from that. So the animals on the Day of Judgment, you know, they get compensation, whether from other animals or from the human beings. Mm -hmm. And then if they don't belong to a human being and the human being asks that this animal will be with them in paradise, then they turn into dust. Mm -hmm. Unless there is a, a, a desire from the, one of the people of paradise to have his pet or something with him. That is something else. Type, Even if it's a dog. I kind of read that question. Um, but then, 
the, so so on, 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 on this regard, the, we know that the pig, what is the consequence of it? After the compensation, it turns into dust. Ahmad al-Azhari, we don't know. He will go to paradise or will go to billah hellfire. So the consequence of Ahmad is unknown. Mm. The consequence of the pig is known. And in Islam, we give preference to what is known mm. over what is unknown. So from this regard, knowledge is better than ignorance. So from this perspective, the pig is better than the individual. See, from this perspective. Mm. So don't, uh, 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 the, the lower self will try to find a way to comfort itself for the sacrifice it is doing as it is being disciplined and tamed. Mm. Uh, so uh, if it, it should, number one, it should not cross one's mind that they are better than, than someone who is not praying taraweeh uh, as a Muslim or mm. a non-Muslim altogether who is spending the night in their own way. Mm. Right? Because you don't know the consequence. Mm? You have to know Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala who is the second in rank right after Sayyidina Abu Bakr second in rank in terms of the Ummah mm. but that is only after he became a Muslim now before Sayyidina Umar became a Muslim he used to get drunk he worshipped idols right he slapped his sister um, uh, on her face when he, when he knew that she was reciting the Quran and and her face, you know, it, she bled because of that. She got bruised because of that slap. Mm. Mm. If someone looked at Sayyidina Umar in the moment in which he slapped his sister, mm. right? And she was bruised. Would say this person would never enter paradise. Few weeks later, Sayyidina Umar is the second in rank. <laughs> so you might be thinking, okay, now I'm standing in Taraweeh. My non-Muslim friend is in a pub. I am better than them. Well, he might be like Sayyidina Umar. And it's just a few more days and that person is a much higher rank than you are. You don't know? You don't know? Mm. So, mm. Uh, 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 whenever the lower self comes to you with this kind of prompting, a reminder of Sayyidina Umar. This is the example that Sayyidina Imam Ghazali mentioned. <laughs> Remind your lower self of Sayyidina Umar. So that person might be like Sayyidina Umar. Mm -hmm. Then it, it, the, the, it, it, it kind of you know, withdraws its, uh, <laughs> its army. <laughs> so I, I think like that's such a beautiful point, Ibrash. I think even in uh, the, the many examples of Sayyidina Umar, in his life, he was always so quick to recognize this fact as well, you know. Uh, after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, when he was so afraid that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveal a verse about him and he heard that something was revealed, he would even say, you know, tell my mother that, you know, I am no more. Before he went to the <laughs> meet the Prophet in a, in, in, a, in a story where he, he met one of the elderly women who the Prophet Islam had experience with and she, she had kind of rebuked him, gave him a, a, a feedback or something like that. And he would say, uh, take note that on this day, you know, I have been bested by this old woman. Something. He was so quick to recognize this fact as well as we mentioned and i think one of the most beautiful things you also mentioned in the podcast as well was the the the, the fact that we have to balance of being you know having a solid uh, solid uh, kind of like a individual mindset in the month of Ramadan, going to like uh, seclusion in the month of Ramadan as compared to uh, being too social or commercializing Ramadan as well. I think the beautiful part about having a community is that, you know, uh, you know everyone brings something to the table, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone has a different focus in the month of Ramadan. And although you have your own focus when you're around of people of piety and spiritual awareness, you get reminded by what, what, what they're doing, right? You get yeah. reminded of what they are looking at in this month of Ramadan. Mm -hmm. And in, in that sense, when we surround ourselves with people like, like this, we are always reminded that there's always more to do. There's always more to take note of, right? I might be focusing on being more generous in 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 holistic ways, right? Let's see another person, and and he is ex, ex, so much more uh, friendlier in the month of Ramadan. So much more, he has so much more love in the month of Ramadan. I'm reminded, oh yeah, you know, this is something that I might be missing out as well in my own experience. So, I think having that community is so important as well, and this is one of the benefits as well. And inshallah, you know, in the next podcast that we're gonna release this week, we're gonna talk about the experience of new Muslims, right? As, as Shane has mentioned, right, in Ramadan, you know, although there are some practices that we that we are accustomed to doing like Taraweeh, we are reading the Quran a lot, but, you know, the, the, the school of Ramadan, you know, majority of it is to teach the meaning of Ramadan and teach us about ourselves, right? This shows that Ramadan is not only for the one that has a lot of devotional practices, right? Ramadan is for everybody. 
Right, so we're going to go into that conversation a little bit, delve into how newer Muslims can also prepare and experience Ramadan as, as meaningful as someone that has already gone through many years of Ramadan, inshallah. Mm-hmm. And at this point, we'll just end the podcast by reciting Tasbir Kafara and Surah Asr. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika sharwa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ila. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Al-Asri inna l-insana la fi khus illa nadhira man wa amilu salihati wa tawasam bil haqi wa tawasam bil sabr. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you.